As a culture, we certainly have a fascination with learning more about other people. That's what keeps TMZ, Entertainment Tonight, Inquirer, People Magazine in business. That quest to know more about those we admire, respect, venerate, and revere. Whether it be on the sports field, in the music business, our politicians, whenever we see them and they do something admirable, we want to know more about them. And whenever they do something less admirable and let us down, we want to know more about them. I say the same holds true with God. We know quite a bit about God, or we think we do. What we're confronted with this morning is do we truly know God? Last week in the first chapter of Believe, we talked about the greatness of God. This creator, in the beginning, God. We just read from the psalmist who wrote this in our call to worship. God is the maker of heaven and earth. This great God is a triune God. So vast, we explain this one God as three persons. And we use fancy church terms such as omniscient, transcendent, omnipotent, omnipresent. Even the words are big to describe this big God. In the second chapter this morning, we move to a different understanding of God. This morning, we learn about God's goodness. God's purpose for being God is to be in relationship with us. Think about that. It's all about relationship. From the very beginning, God could have been very content with the stars and the ocean and the mountains and the animals and the fish. He didn't stop there. He just didn't want a big zoo. He created us to be in relationship with Him, even from the very beginning. Even in the garden with Adam and Eve, He walked in the garden with them. Even as He birthed a nation with Abraham and Sarah, He was there. Even as He hung on the cross, He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, I'm still in relationship with you. And you know something, friends, as we talk about this personal God, as we talk about God's goodness and relationship with us, we can't forget, and we would be remiss if we did, forget to talk about suffering in this relationship. God blesses us with freedom and allows us to even suffer. Now, which to some discounts God's goodness. Some say, well, if there's a God, why does he let us suffer? But friends, if you even take God out of the picture, suffering would still exist. What changes with God and God's goodness in the picture is that our suffering is now shared. Our pain is offered peace and our grief is given grace. So what's the key idea in this second chapter? Last week we talked about the greatness of God. This week my key idea is this. God is small. Hmm. God is small. Last week we learned about how big God is. This week, God is small. Let me unpack this just for a moment. 
God is small because God is close. In the Old Testament, there's stories upon stories upon stories of this distant God out there somewhere. And the people try to appease this God, not anger this God, be in fear of this God through sacrifices and obeying the law. As this progresses into the New Testament, we come face to face with Emmanuel. God is no longer out there, but God is now with us in the form of Jesus, which distinguishes Christianity from every other religion. God is now with us, but it gets closer. It gets even better. As Jesus is crucified, is resurrected and ascends to heaven, he leaves behind the advocate. The Holy Spirit. That means that God that was once out there, that was here with us in the form of Jesus, is now inside of us. Yeah, like a pizza. <laughs> He's inside of us to comfort, to be a friend. It is God within. God is small because God is close. But secondly, God cares. I'm going to share a passage with you that I would imagine many of you could probably recite off the top of your head, but I'm going to recite John 3.16 in a different version to see if it zings us a little bit from the message. It says this. This is how much God loved the world. He gave His Son his one and only Son, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed. By believing in Him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. A little different. What that shares with me, friends, is this. That this God becomes flesh and enters our suffering on the cross. We said before that the existence of suffering is often used to disprove the existence of God. Has anybody ever shared that with you? I don't believe there's a God because if there was a God, why in the world would he make you suffer? My counter to that is this. By saying that the willingness of God to suffer proves the very existence of the goodness of God. That God used and uses suffering to come right alongside of us, to care for us, to love us. God is small. He's close. He cares. God is small, and please don't forget it that God also has a plan. Not a predestined, robotic, automata, creepy, Stepford Wives kind of plan. Not that kind of plan. We need to understand that creation is an ever-evolving plan. Think of it this way. We all create every day of our lives with a plan. We go to work with a plan. We play with a plan. We study for a plan. We ponder to come up with a plan. We fellowship with each other with a plan. We organize. We plan for a purpose. God has the ultimate plan to restore God's intended good creation, and His plan is always emerging, always transpiring and always evolving. Let me take you back in time. 600 B.C. 600 B.C. The prophet Jeremiah shares these words, and these words are as relevant back then as they are on September 27, 2015. What was said, I quote, 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Isn't that great news? Isn't this wonderful theology? But that's all it is. I theologically come to you this morning to say God is small because he's close, because he cares, and because he has a plan. Well, whip de doo How do we apply this? What does that mean for us? A few things that I've done. First, it means if you apply that, that God sees the big picture. We see from the valley, God sees from the mountaintop. We read a single page, God has written the book. So often our frustrations, our anger, our disappointments stem from failing to embrace our limitedness. Think of it this way. God is faithful with the infinite. All he asks of us is to be loyal with the finite. That's all. God sees the infinite. Secondly, not only does God see the big picture, God sees the little details. We can find solace in the dichotomy that nothing is too big or too small for God. Whatever we name as hurt, fear, suffering, or woundedness, God sees it, God hears it, God touches it. But it gets even better. It gets even better. Here it is. I'm going back to on you for a moment. God isn't done with us yet. Can I get it all in? in your name.